We'll now have the closing response by Dr. Ayala. Sorry? The closing response? Okay, yes, yes. Uh, let, let me tell you, just for the record, there is no absence of evidence for the mechanism of natural selection for evolution. Hundreds of books, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of articles made by thousands and thousands of people who know how to use the scientific method, which consists in making predictions and testing them one at a time. No extrapolation, testing. But let me tell you that one of my arguments for intelligent design, as I uh, formulate in the book, is scientific, and I have most of the chapters are scientific. I have philosophical arguments, and I have separate chapters dedicated to philosophical issues, and there are theological arguments, religious arguments, and these are the ones that I think should matter most to people of faith. Uh, because the theory of intelligent design accomplishes exactly the opposite of what it intends. I know that the proponents of intelligent design are by and large people of good faith, and they think that the science demonstrates the existence of God is a good thing. But that's not what happens. The implications of the intelligent design are profoundly, profoundly anti-religious, and I think that's an important reason religious reason, there are scientific reasons too, and philosophical, but the religious reason to reject intelligent design. And this is what I want to tell you uh, now. So, alternative to evolution, intelligent design. Very briefly, just for uh, the record, here is Behe's statement of why we detect the sign when a number of separate interacting components are ordered in such a way as to accomplish the function beyond the individual components, as it happens in the eye, for example, but also in the flagellum, the, the bacteria that he, and, all, and the other examples, and they all have been explained in detail how they have evolved one step at a time, like in very large outline I have told you about the eye. Well, so the critique of evolution is wrong. Um, and that was stated after six weeks of trial by Judge Jones in federal court in Pennsylvania in the Dover district. Uh, here you have a person who knew nothing about evolution, a born again Christian, an evangelical Christian, appointed by W. Bush, and, oops, something happened. Oh, here it is. The only movement that represents the status of the theory of evolution in the scientific community, the same thing we have been seeing, causes students to doubt validity without scientific justification, present students with a religious alternative masquerade as a scientific theory. It is not science, I have been arguing that, because it cannot be tested precisely for the reasons that Professor Craig said. How do we know the intentions of the designer? Maybe the designer does not want to make things perfect. He wants to make them imperfect. So we cannot do anything with statements of that kind in science. We have to be able to make predictions as to what uh, should be tested. And there is no evidence. You know, in 1998, Philip Johnson, emeritus professor of law at the University of California in Berkeley, said, well, I agree that there, are no, there is no evidence for intelligent design, but give us five or ten years. Ten years went by, there is no evidence. But now, I, my main point, final point, is contrary to religion. And this is a very personal view. And I want to convince you that I want to let you know how I see things and why I see intelligent design as extremely dangerous and destructive to religion. Look at the human jaw. You know, it's not big enough for the teeth. So we have the wisdom tooth teeth removed and the orthodontist have to straighten the other ones. Intelligent design. An engineer that we have designed the human job would fire the next day. I don't want my God, you know, omnipotent and benevolent to have designed the human job or the human birth canal. Look what happens in the world of nature when, to take one example, when a baboon 
that is a male who lives in a troop, in a group of typically a male baboon, a dominant baboon with 15, 20 females, most of them with infants which are lactating. When the baboon is killed, the dominant male, by another baboon, or is replaced, or somehow um, it disappears and another baboon takes over, another male baboon, the male baboon that comes in, the first thing it does is to kill all the babies. This is exactly what you would expect from natural selection. Because a male baboon that does that will transmit his genes more effectively to the following generation. Once the babies are killed, the female is going to estros, so now they are going to carry the genes of that baboon. The genes that made that baboon kill the, other, the babies are the genes that are transmitted more effectively to the next generation. I prefer to see this as natural selection rather than as a consequence of design by an intelligent designer, by the creator. Well, so I think intelligent design implications are blasphemous because they imply that God is inept, like in the design of the job, and everything else, you know, every part that we can look of a human being, or every animal or plant, is incompetently designed. Uh, and it's a cruelty, like in the baboon, I have not gone into this other uh, uh, elaboration, elaborating these other points, but look, parasites exist only for the purpose of destroying their hosts. They cannot live but by killing. I don't want the God of benevolence and the omnipotent God to be given the credit for having made that creation. But look at this last point. 20% of all human pregnancies end in abortion, spontaneous abortion, because the human reproductive system is a mess. It's so poorly designed that 20% of the babies die within the first two months. 20% of all babies, 100 million babies born per year in the world, 20 million abortions, babies that never are going to come to live. Attributed that to attributing the design of human beings to the Creator implies that the Creator is responsible for the 20 million abortions per year. I don't want to have anything to do with ideas that have that implication. So that's why I think evolution is the great gift to religion. You know, with the beginning of the of science when Copernicus and Galileo and Newton came about. There was a big breathing among many breathing, uh, as in breath, uh, among uh, many theologians. Because now when a tsunami happens and kills two million people in Indonesia, I don't have to say it's God punishing the Indonesians, or when a earthquake happens in China and keeps 50,000 Chinese just last year, the Indonesian tsunami was three or four years ago, or when the Soviets erupts and destroys completely Pompeii Herculaneum. You don't have to say it's God causing these deaths. It's natural processes. And the same with the living organisms. When we have 20 million abortions, per year in the world, we don't have to say they are due to God's design. They are the result of natural processes. That's why, again, I say that evolution is that which, uh, evolution is a gift not only to science but to religion, and I have written this book, Darwin's Gift to Science and Religion. Thank you. And now the closing response by Dr. Craig. Well, it looks like I am going to wind up talking about theology after all tonight, because Dr. Ayala has in his last speech deserted the scientific arguments and gone exclusively now for the theological arguments against ID. And I find it 
very ironic that in tonight's debate between a biologist and a theologian, the theologian wants to talk biology and the biologist wants to talk theology. But let, let's do that. We've not seen any good scientific evidence tonight to think that idea is not viable. So what about these theological objections? Could we have slide 19, please, of the PowerPoints I have? Even though I think it's strictly irrelevant, I'll talk about the theological problem of natural evil. First, let's talk about design flaws in nature. There are various ways in which the Christian theologian might respond to these. First, he might challenge the assumption that these alleged flaws are really flaws at all. Take, for example, the common claim that the placement of the optic nerve in the human eye is flawed. Might God have a good biological reason for so designing the eye? Yes, indeed. As Michael Denton explains, the difference in the placement of the optic nerve in the human eye in comparison with the cephalopod eye is because of the need for a greater supply of oxygen in warm-blooded animals. So this alleged flaw turns out not to be a flaw at all. Over and over again, we have found that what we at first thought were flaws in nature's design have, with greater understanding, turned out not to be flaws at all. But suppose that there are flaws that seem to be the result of natural selection. Fine. Even special creationists usually hold that the kinds created by God in Genesis were on the biological level of the order or family and that evolution took over from there. So, for example, God created the common ancestor of the family Orcidae, or the bear family, which has since evolved into eight different species. It's hardly surprising, then, that one species of bear has evolved the so-called pan his thumb, which is sometimes touted as a design flaw, uh, namely in the species of the panda. And it hardly needs to be said that theologians who don't embrace special creationism but accept the thesis of common ancestry are not at all surprised that organisms would bear the design imprint of their ancestors. So I don't think this argument from design flaws is a very serious theological problem at all. What then about animal behaviors that strike us as cruel? Once again, even creationists embrace evolution within broad kinds, which permits organisms to change. For example, pathogenic or disease-producing bacteria were once free-living organisms, which evolved to become pathogenic parasites. Genome sequencing has revealed this to be a sort of devolution characterized by a massive loss of genes. Now, of course, this appeal to limited evolution within broad kinds won't ameliorate the general problem of animal suffering. But this is a theological problem which also afflicts Professor Ayala's view as well. Dr. Ayala seems strangely oblivious to the fact that when he quotes in his book, David Hull, to the effect that the God implied by evolutionary theory is careless, wasteful, indifferent, almost diabolical, Hall is talking about Dr. Ayala's God. So Darwin's so-called gift, I think, may well turn out to be a Trojan horse. Thus, theologians of all stripes have to face the problem of animal suffering. And here, studies in biology have provided, I think, surprising new insights into this old problem. If we could have slides 20 to 26, please. In his book, Nature, Red in Tooth and Claw, Michael Murray distinguishes three levels in a hierarchy of pain. Level 1, uh, 20 please, slide 20. Level 1 is information bearing neural states which are produced by noxious stimuli resulting in aversive behavior. Level 2 is a first order subjective awareness of pain. And then level three is a second level awareness that one is oneself experiencing, too. Now, spiders and insects, the sort of the creatures exhibiting the kinds of behavior mentioned by Professor Ayala, like praying mantises, experience one. But there's no reason at all to attribute two to such creatures. It's plausible that they aren't sentient beings at all, having some sort of inner subjective experience. That sort of experience plausibly doesn't arrive until you get to the level of vertebrates. But even though higher animals do experience pain, 
Nevertheless, the evidence is that they don't experience level three, that is to say, the awareness that they are themselves in pain. For the awareness that one is oneself in pain requires self-awareness, and this is connected with the prefrontal cortex of the brain, which is missing in all other animals except for the humanoid primates. And thus, even though animals may experience pain, they are not aware of being in pain. God, in his mercy, has apparently spared animals the awareness of being in pain. Now, this is a tremendous comfort to those of us who are pet owners, because it means that even though your cat or your dog may be in pain, he or she really isn't aware of being in pain. And therefore, your dog or your cat doesn't suffer the way you would if you were in pain. And what this also means is that arguments like Dr. Ayala's, based upon nature's so-called cruelties, are guilty of the fallacy of anthropopathism, which is ascribing human feelings to non-human entities. We humans have an inveterate tendency to ascribe personal agency to non-human creatures and even to objects. We talk to our cars, to house plants, to computers. When we attribute agency and pain awareness to animals, we commit the fallacy of anthropopathism. Now, of course, the question still remains for both Professor Ayala and myself. Why did God create a world featuring an evolutionary prelude to the appearance of man? And I suspect that the answer to that question is going to have to do with God's wider plan for humanity, with his desire to create an ecosystem where autonomous human agents can flourish and make an uncoerced decision to embrace or to reject God's offer of saving grace. But a discussion of theological questions of that sort would take us very far afield this evening. Finally, let me comment on Dr. Ayala's claim that ID is not science. For me, it's really a matter of relative indifference whether you class a design inference in biology as science or not. The important question is whether such an inference is warranted, and that can't be decided by mere definitions. Our esteemed moderator, Bradley Monton, in his recent book says, even though I'm an atheist, I want to defend intelligent design by taking issue with this line of attack. Ultimately, what we really want to know isn't whether intelligent design is science. What we really want to know is whether in intelligent design is true. We could, if we wanted, agree that intelligent design is not science. But if it turns out that intelligent design is true, would the fact that it's not science really matter? Well, not really, I think. And so the real question is, is it true? And we've not seen anything tonight to think that it's not a viable alternative. Now, Dr. Ayala says that intelligent design doesn't make predictions or conduct research. Well, I simply beg to differ. Take a look at Stephen Meyer's recent book, The Signature in the Cell. It includes 17 pages of predictions and possible research projects to be pursued. Michael Behe has recently written, the most essential prediction of Darwinism is that given an astronomical number of chances, unintelligent processes can make seemingly designed systems, one of the complexity of those found in the cell. ID specifically denies this, predicting that in the absence of intelligent input, no such systems would develop. So Darwinism and ID make clear opposite predictions of what we should find when we examine genetic results from a stupendous number of organisms that are under relentless pressure from natural selection. The recent genetic results on bacteria and viruses that I quoted are a stringent test. The results, one, Darwinism's prediction is falsified, two, design's prediction is confirmed.